Hey guys, and welcome to the show. Um, today, our special guest is hmm, Ryan Barry. Ryan's a frequent guest on our show, mostly because he knows his stuff. And today, he's going to talk about containers. So, without further ado, let's get on with the show. Hey, Ryan, how's it going, bud? It is going well. How are you doing, Lex? Man, I'm doing all right. We um, have done a containers episode before a long time ago. Yes, uh, but much uh, has changed. I've, yeah, much has changed, and that's yeah. why I thought it would be a good idea to, to do a, a, a an updated uh, containers uh, episode. Sure. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I think that's that's a great idea. Um, you know, and I, I, I like your approach to you know starting simple and being able to you know relay you know the the what and the why and then we can kind of show a little bit of the how so yeah you know. so yeah. yeah so absolutely so what i'm going to do is i think i'm going to tell you what i think containers mm -hmm. are and can do okay. so uh, a container is essentially a way for us to virtualize an application and all of the support components that go along with that application so that you don't have to run an entire OS to launch an application. You just have to essentially virtualize the stuff that the application calls upon. Yep. Yeah. There's a number of benefits when you think about, um, you know, com common scenarios when it comes to, I, I give you some very specific examples. So you have, let's say you have a .NET Core application, you know, one in you know, that uses .NET Core, you know, 2.2, one that uses .NET Core 3, and you're deploying it to a server that, that um, you know, with IIS installed on it that you want to be able to host it in. So there's some dependencies on, you know, very tight dependencies on your application and some underlying version of .NET. It could be breaking changes between 2.2 and 3.0. This is running, you know, so the, the 2.2 application might not behave as designed or intended. Um, so one of the benefits that containers can bring to the table is being able to deploy your application with the runtime components, the specific versions of assemblies, and um, uh, you know any references that, that your application needs to run, um, and deploy those as a package into a, you know a server, um, so you can be guaranteed that your application is going to behave as intended. You know, and the other part is that you know, particularly as it pertains to cloud. There's a real world, world cost, you know, to both us in providing infrastructure to customers to be able to use to host applications, and also to customers using those resources for their own applications. So, um, you know, there's a there's a driver or driving force to be able to help customers optimize those costs and be able to really make, um, you know, effective use in and uh, you know of of uh, resources in Azure. So when it comes to compute resources, that means making you know loading up those machines with as many applications as you can and doing that's easier said than done and you know some of the container uh, you know specifically kubernetes you know some of those engines allow the compute environments in the cloud to be able to manage you know kind of move those applications around depending on what resources they need how much ram how many uh, how much of the cpu they need what the load is in those applications, um, you know, that is one of the nodes going offline. You know, that, so it handles all of those scenarios and moves your application around to be able to make sure it's highly available and as as performant. To, and and include, like I said earlier, you know, includes all the dependencies. So there's a lot of stuff that it provides. Um, we can talk a little bit about that. But you're you're absolutely right that one way to think of it is like an application virtualization. Cool. Yeah, that was a long way to say that. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I just, yeah, it just, you know, there's kind of two. You know, I don't have any. Yeah, good no, I got that. it. I thought that was awesome. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so, yeah, yeah. are you going to Charleston in 30 days? I'm just thinking out loud here. Is there, uh, is there Charles a vacation in your future? Uh, yes, there is actually. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's <laughs> <laughs> yes, my, uh, my, my, my do not book work trip board that my, uh, <laughs> my wife puts everything on that, uh, that you know, I need to make sure I, uh, <laughs> I need I, one of those. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. All yeah. right. So you've got a demo for us, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. I've got a little bit of stuff. We'll talk, uh, talk about kind of the internals and how, how, uh, you know, containers and orchestrators work and then we'll, uh, we'll step through a demo. Okay. And while you, while you pull that up, what, what's the difference between a container and an orchestrator? So that is a, a good question. Um, so I have, uh, I'll talk a little bit about containers and we'll talk about how the, what the orchestrator brings to the table. So that's a okay. good segue. So would Docker be an orchestrator? 
Um, so Doc, yes, there is a Docker enterprise. There, there's a, the Docker does have an orchestrator. Uh, you know, Docker probably wouldn't appreciate my saying that it's not as as uh, used as, as Kubernetes. I think that that's the one that's sort of taken the world by storm. Okay. Um, but it, uh, it it's it's an engine. We'll, I'll show you the a a view or glimpse into my uh, the the cluster of servers that I have running. With some applications deployed and kind of walk through a little bit about what the what the orchestrator provides for you it's you know i, I mentioned about you know balancing applications uh based on availability of resources so if a you know server gets the rug ripped out from underneath it because of maintenance reasons or some issue in the cloud um or if it, you know these can run on premises too so maybe if there's an issue you know with hardware on premises uh the orchestrator manages moving all of the containers around onto compute resources that you've told it that they need. Yeah. Uh, so so it, it kind of is the engine that, that moves stuff around for you. OK, cool. Yeah. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, dive into this a little bit. Virtualization has been around for a while. You know, there's Hyper-V and VMware. Um, you know, the, the environments that allow you to um, attempt to make you know fairly effective use of host resources, and you can oversubscribe those resources and be able to run more uh, virtual machines than the you know physical capacity that you have available. Um, but when you think about it, every time you deploy a a um, an application, which you know, down here in the on the bottom, you know, showing uh, I'm sorry at the top, uh, showing a traditional virtual machine that you have the hardware sitting on the bottom, uh, and then you have you know some host operating system. Um, you know whether whether it's you know some sort of flavor of Linux or VMware you know, uh, server server core for for Hyper V that ha that needs to run all of the virtual machines sitting on top of that as well as any sort of management software that sits on top of that and as you spin up virtual machines every one of those virtual machines has a complete operating system it has its own kernel um, it gets a virtualized network resource. Um, you know, and then you can install anything you wish on, onto that VM. But they're fairly heavyweight resources. I mean, if you think about, you know, typical VM, you know, on Azure, I think the smallest, uh, you know, Windows VM might be like 30 or so gigs. I think there might be a couple smaller options. But, you know, the, the boot disk for that image is, is big. Um, plus, there's a lot, of, a lot of weight involved in having a duplicative kernel. So, you know, you have the kernel of your hypervisor sitting here, but then you have the kernel for every one of your VMs. So there's a, a lot of overhead, a lot of overhead that has to be, um, you know, bared to, um, you know, be able to create these receptacles to deploy applications or other workloads. So sure. you know, and perfectly applicable in some, or in, in necessary in some environments or scenarios, but it, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're taking up on unnecessary CPU resources just to be able to run that, that little box. Right, exactly. Yeah, especially if you're just going to run one app or two apps on it. Exactly. Yep. Um, so where containers come into play, and and we'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff at the bottom and and uh, how that differs in a minute. Um, so where um, you know with with a container, you can run. Um, uh, and actually, I'll go back to your comment about Docker as well, because there's some interesting things about that when it, with regards to developers doing testing on their own workstations. It, you have some level of hardware, and this could be a server, um, you know, or your own laptop rather, or a server, um, you know, running a server operating system or a desktop operating system. Um, and the containers themselves um, all share the same kernel that is being used to surface the operating system. So like my, for example, my, my laptop has, you know, Windows 10 on it. I have Docker installed on it. Docker is a runtime engine that allows you to run containers. It doesn't have some of the orchestration capabilities that, that I'll talk about that Kubernetes has uh, when you run it you know, natively in a workstation. But every container that I load on my workstation doesn't have this operating system box. So it's using the underlying kernel to be able to access things like the disk subsystem, uh, the, you know, the network interfaces, any peripheral devices. Um, you know, so I, so the, the benefit that you gain is that these containers can be extremely lightweight and portable. Um, you know, .NET application might be, when you think about the .NET Core and some, you know, OS components to be able to run the .NET Core application might be, you know, 12 to 20 or 50 megs in size versus, you know, 30 gigs over on the, on the right-hand side. Um, so you, you have the benefit of them being much smaller, uh, much more portable. Um, and then you, um, 
you know, you gain some benefits from being able to, you know, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to include all the runtime bits, um, you know, much like you would on a VM, but you can isolate applications from one another. So you can have, you know, application V1 that might be using, you know, a, a, a older version of .NET Core, using that as an example, in application V2 that uses a newer version of that, of that um, uh, .NET Core, and you're not having to rely on what's living here on the kernel of the operating system everything's running on. You can kind of self-contain everything, hence the name, you know, containers, in, in those deployment manifests. Uh, there's some things that that I'll talk about too, that, that an orchestrator provides that you can actually take um, many containers. So it's typical that an application might be comprised of, uh, you know, Mongo, MySQL, database backend, maybe a web, uh, you know, web front end as well as an application server. So there's a way that you can actually describe to the, uh, the, the, you know, container runtime engine saying uh, these applications are related to one another. Uh, you know, this container, the, the front end web application listens in port 80. It talks over port 443 to back end web, uh, web service or application service. And I don't, by the way, I don't want this application service to be made public on the internet. Um, and this application talks again to a database. And um, you can actually, you know, define through a manifest file or describe to the, the container runtime or the, the runtime engine and environment how those things are related to one another. So it, it brings, um, brings to the table more than just running, you know, s isolated applications. You can group them together and and, and create a deployment manifest and kind of and, and deploy them to your environment. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some some things that that we have um, uh, specifically, you know, the uh, Windows Server containers that actually allows you to run uh, containers uh, on a Windows server. So you know, this is a simple way to be able to deploy applications and run them without without some of the um, orchestrator nuances and so forth. So it's a really fast and, and easy way to deploy applications. Some parts of Azure, when you actually go to the Azure portal and go to like a PowerShell environment or the Bash shell that's, that's integrated right in the, in the website or, or browser rather, um, those are actually running as containers under the cover. So when you click, I need a new Bash cell, shell, it actually spins up a container under the covers to actually, uh, you know, connect you to that environment. Um, you know, in that case, it's an inter interactive shell that you can use to manage your, your Azure uh, subscription. Um, so there's also a variation of that with um, uh, Hyper-V containers. It kind of contains, you know, some aspects of the underlying uh, Hyper-V kernel. It's a, like a lighter weight way to be able to create some isolation across applications. Um, and, and, you know, and, and by isolation, I mean, you know, having some, um, you know, some uh, duplicative components of the kernel across those containers too. So we're not going to talk about those bottom two, just kind of highlighting that there, those two exist. Okay, cool. All right. So um, let me uh, go to, um, I got a couple more slides I can talk about. So I talked about, um, you know the the benefits that um, containers bring to the the table with regards to increasing the density of your environment. So if you think about you know having um, you know the you know your your hardware with a host operating system and a hypervisor sitting on top of it, some number of, of virtual machines that that um, you know you you are using a lot of those underlying operating system resources to run. Um, you know, or, or the, the hardware resources rather to run your, your every one of those virtual machines. So running as in a container, you can actually densely pack all of your applications, much like what you said earlier, you know, the virtualizing your application, deploying those to a virtual machine and having, you know, some sort of engine or runtime environment that actually is able to, you know, to, to know how to mount and run those, uh, those containers. Um, so, you know, the, the, the benefit from a cost standpoint, as I mentioned at the beginning, is that you know, you can reduce the number of VMs. I have a customer who had a SaaS product running in Azure, and they had their minimum footprint for their application was 13 web servers or 13 servers. I shouldn't say they, were, they weren't all web servers, 13 servers. So um, moving that to a container-based deployment model, um, they were able to run it with three. So wow. they re reduced the number of VMs by 10. So that was a huge savings. Yeah. And, and the application performed just as well, uh, you know, containerizing things. So it's, it's 
it, you know, granted those three machines are running very hot, but it, it doesn't matter because in the cloud world, we charge the same to a customer if that machine is running 0% or 100% CPU. So it's wow. much more beneficial to run them hot than it is to, you know, to, to not. Yeah. All right, so um, talk a little bit about uh, Kubernetes. And it, it's just virtually hot. Yeah, yeah, there you go, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so let me uh, back up a little bit. So um, Kubernetes is, a, is, one, is an orchestrator that has, um, you know, an endpoint that you can use to be able to, you know, manage and deploy applications into, you know, the cluster, the cluster of, of nodes, compute nodes under the covers. Um, and there's a a uh, a master node that that uh, monitors all of the what we call uh, oh you know worker nodes. Worker nodes is where your applications run. It's where your your containers run. Um, interesting thing about Azure is that um, you know if you were to deploy a Kubernetes environment in your data center or you know co-location provider, um, you would have to build you know some number of master nodes. You know typically more than one to make it highly available. Um, you'd have to deploy those. Um, to be able to have it kind of manage all of the aspects of the worker nodes where your applications are running. In Azure, when you're using our Kubernetes service, um, what's in the, the uh, outline here, this dash line box, um, this is actually provided as part of the service. Um, so it's a, it's a huge benefit to a customer to not have to manage, you know, the runtime components that are running on that master node. Um, this is actually where um, this is the the interface that you actually talk to when you're using some of the command line tools to tell your cluster, hey, I want to deploy this application. I want it, I want two ver two instances of this application to run. I want it to listen on port X Y Z. You want to have a public IP. All of that stuff is is sent to the master node. The master node says, ah, okay, based on what you're asking for, I'm going to run it on these worker nodes. So it kind of orchestrates where it runs, and it also monitors all of the worker nodes to to know if um, you know one of them fails for some reason, uh, then it will move. You know, you know um, let's just say there's two worker nodes, or, or uh, use a, a, a simpler example. Let's say there's three worker nodes, and you've requested a, that at least two instances of a web application remain running at all times. Um, so if one of those servers goes down because of some issue, um, and it happens to be one of the nodes is running one of the instances of your application, the master node will know that. And it will actually redeploy your application um, on another one of the nodes that's still running. So, oh, that's cool. yeah, so it, it balances things out for you. So this is doing a lot of work on the covers. Um, and then the the master node also supports all the communication between um, between the what do we call them? you know kubelets, the 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 uh, you know the uh, modules, if you will, that you have deployed um, to every one of the worker nodes. So, so these applications can also communicate to one another. So you can actually create um, kind of sandbox or isolated communication pathways. So, let, you know, using my example, let's just say that this is a a database server, MongoDB. This is a web application, um, and then maybe you have a production version of that application and a test version running on the same cluster. You can actually create isolated network. Uh, boundaries around that to allow the production instance of your application to only talk over this virtualized, you know, network pathway to the the MongoDB that's production under the covers, and likewise, the same holds true in the in the um, uh, you know for for the uh, a test instance. So it's a way to you can actually isolate them, you know, much like you can in the VM world. Um, you can actually create you know deployments that contain that are comprised of multiple. Uh, um, you know, um, you know, containers and actually define pathways that allows containers to communicate with one another. Um, and then, so within, um, so there's Docker, and so Docker is a is a runtime engine. So the or, or a uh, kind of a format for containers. So that's a kind of a universally accepted way to package up your application as a Docker image. And you can deploy it into a repository. Um, you know, we have a, a repository in Azure called um, suitably named Azure Container Registry. Actually, is in what that it's a receptacle that you actually deploy your containers into. So when you actually go and tell the the Kubernetes cluster, hey, I want to run this custom application that I've written called you know Hello World. 
um, what the master node will do is it'll go out to that container registry and pull down the images that are needed to, to run it based on the descriptions that you provide it. And it will deploy those across you know, the, any number of worker nodes. Um, and you can, ex you can opt to expose those applications publicly to the internet or not. So you can, you can um, that's all definable in the, in the manifest that, that, um, that you build out. Yeah. So with that, let's go ahead and take a little walk through a, um, a cluster that I have set up. Let me just make sure this is still running. All right, it is. Um, so this is, so let me uh, back up a little bit. Um, let's see, I, let me open up the Azure portal. I just realized I don't have that tab open. Okay. So I've deployed a, a cluster, so I'm using the managed Azure service, which means my master nodes are, are you know, a component piece of Azure as opposed to running them on VMs. You could absolutely deploy your own Kubernetes cluster with your own uh, master nodes uh, running as VMs. But when you, like I said earlier, use a service, um, we do that for you. So you can see that it, it shows up here as this, um, you know, Kubernetes service. And I don't see any I, I can kind of see VMs in here. I can actually go to scale and I can tell it how many compute nodes that I have under the covers. So basically what this does is it tells my master nodes that are running in Azure that there's four uh, virtual CPUs based on the size of the VM that I deploy this cluster with and 14 gigs of RAM because I'm running with two, two servers. So you can, when you deploy a cluster, tell it what or tell us what size VM to use under the covers. But notice, I don't actually see any VMs in here. Um, so uh, I will show you that if I go to my resource groups, there's actually a, a, a resource group that's going to be named uh, MC underscore with the name of your um, your Kubernetes uh, cluster. So that you know, in my case is AKS test um, in the region is also in there as well. So if I click on this, um, this is all of the infrastructure. These are the worker nodes. Um, so it's sort of hidden away from you. So you can manage it here on the service tab, but you can still see the virtual machines that are running under the cover. So you, I can see that there's multiple VMs or part of, of, it, uh, of an availability set, which tells Azure that they're, these machines are exactly the same. Um, you know, so we spread them across different physical servers in our data center. So if there's an issue with one, one rack or you know, a power supply or top of rack router or something along those lines, and there's some um, insulation, um, you know, from a failure standpoint between these these virtual machines. So I've only I only have two in my cluster, and I can see all the corresponding stuff that goes along with it. You know, the disks and uh, the public IP addresses that are created that are, that are associated with applications that are deployed to this cluster and so forth. Um, so so you can even though it's sort of hidden away, you can still see those VMs. You shouldn't have to interfere or do anything with those um, uh, with those virtual machines though. Um, also, you can control what version of the uh, you know, runtime engine is deployed across that cluster. So um, this is actually another benefit of using our service is that those VMs I just showed you, they're, they're, um, they're, they're not only are they hands off, um, you can actually you know, treat them as cattle and that you, know, you can put them out to pasture when, um, you know, when it comes time to upgrading them and, and you know, we'll, we'll make sure that we keep things patched and up to date for you. So there's some um, you know, benefits to, to using the service versus kind of rolling your own and having to do that yourself. Um, so also in, the, in this portal, I can see some basic details about um, uh, actually more than basic, I can see details of how many nodes are running in my cluster, um, how many pods, these are, are um, you know, applications that I have deployed in my, my environment, how much memory is actually being used collectively across all those nodes. Um, I can see details of the um, individual nodes that I have deployed. I have an unknown node here, I upgraded my, uh, my, my um, version of AKS, so there's still a kind of a lingering node here that um, it's from that upgrade that you see is not actually actively, you know, running in my environment. So I can see what the CPU uh, usage is, is across those nodes. I can also expand it. And this is where it gets a little interesting. So I, when I deploy an application, uh, and I'll click through and show you some of these applications I've deployed. So you see I have WordPress deployed. I can actually see what nodes are running on when I, when I look at it at this view. 
but this is managed not by me. This is managed by the the orchestrator and, and the master node. So it decides based on what I tell it where to put the application physically. But I, I can still see it physically here if I want it. Um, so and I can also see the containers that I've deployed into this environment. So these are um, applications. Some of these are internal. So interesting thing about Kubernetes is some of the core components of Kubernetes, um, like you know some of the management environments. Um, you know, DNS infrastructure, metric server, uh, Tiller, I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, so these are are actually deployed as, as you know, containers. So what a better way to host some of the infrastructure needed to manage the infrastructure that you're running applications on than deploying it simply as a container. So some of these are kind of system ones, um, and some of them are ones I've actually deployed, like MariaDB is actually supporting um, a... Uh, uh, an application I deployed. There's WordPress running out on here. Um, so, so some of these, you know, this is kind of a mixture of applications I've deployed and ones that are internal to to um, Kubernetes. This is a view that you get in Azure. Um, there is also a um, a way to be able to, um, you know, see what's running in your Kubernetes cluster using a uh, a, a management dashboard. And the way you get to this management dashboard, uh, I'm going to go to a, um, uh, actually, let me, uh, an easy way just to show you. If I go back to overview here, if I click this view uh, Kubernetes dashboard, it gives me the command line instructions that I type um, in, uh, you know, in the command line environment. I can actually run this from the command line environment in the Azure portal. So I can actually go to like a bash shell here and, and run this command. Or in my case, I've actually run it on, um, on one of this, on this shell right here. You can see it, AKS browse. Um, so I'm actually, you know, I already have this running. And the reason why um, I wanna point this out is that you can't actually access this portal uh, directly. You can see that it actually creates a tunnel. So I have to hit my local host at port 8001. So it's tunneling back into the AKS cluster uh, to allow me to interact with it. So, oh, that's it, cool. yeah, so, yeah. so it's, it's, Over you know, the local, local host, uh, IP. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, uh, you're kind of creating this SSH tunnel back and it, uh, you know, it's a secure way to be able to manage it and, and get some additional insight into that cluster. Um, when you start working with Kubernetes, um, you'll find that a lot of the command line tools are going to be, become very uh, adaptive being at, at running those. Cause there's a lot of, very quick and easy things you can do with a command line once you familiarize yourself and get acclimated with it. You can definitely do it through the portal, um, but this is, uh, you know, to me, I, I I tend to use this more for um, to double check what's deployed and kind of see what's running and kind of get some additional insight and, and so forth. Um, so if I go into, um, I mean, let me go into services here. Um, so these are all the the um, uh, let me changes to default. So these are the applications that I have deployed into my application. And there's um, some very strangely named things um, in Kubernetes, uh, you know, the developers of Kubernetes, when you don't actually give it a service name, um, and, and by it, I mean an application that you deploy into, into Kubernetes, um, they put some random uh, kind of- Words. Ver yeah, <laughs> verbs, verbs and nouns in front of it. You never heard try of a zeroed goose, <laughs> right? Yeah, so it's kind of and actually, if I look at some of the other ones, uh, just to, if, I, if I go back to a Kube system, uh, I, I put a uh, nginx controller on here, uh, Lucky Rottweiler. So <laughs> some interesting names to get assigned if you if you don't actually provide one yourself. Okay. Um, so I have a couple applications that are running on here. So how do you get an application into Kubernetes? So I will show you how um, what's comprised of an application. Um, so there, there is a um, there's a markup language that you use. It's a it's a um, kind of a, a subset of JSON, yet another markup language, a YAML file that you use to describe the application. So I'm going to open up one. Um, Where do you get the application subscriptions? I'm I'm sure that they're published somewhere usually. Yeah, so so there's a couple ways. Um, in the examples I'm showing, these are actually from um, you know these are publicly available container images that you can use for either uh, you know these are test applications um, or in the case of Nginx, you know ones that are made available more commercially for for uh, you know individuals to use. Um, 
Um, you can you can also connect up Kubernetes cluster to I mentioned earlier the the Azure Container Registry. So if you have line of business applications, maybe ones you'd only want to deploy internally, you don't want the source code to be available externally, you don't want the you know containers that kind of contains all the runtime bits and config files to be available externally. Uh, Azure Container Registry is, is private. So you need credentials. You need to connect. You need to provide credentials to Kubernetes, your Kubernetes uh, cluster, to tell it how to connect to your Azure Container Registry to be able to pull down the images and runtime components needed. Um, in my example here, all of these are publicly available, either from Docker Hub or from uh, GitHub or, or or you know some some container registry. Um, so this application has a um, uh, there's a you know, some some versioning. Is defined in it. So this is actually kind of the metadata that describes how my application runs uh, within within the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so I, I'm giving in this particular case, I actually give it a name. So that's why um, vote back and vote front doesn't have things like zero goose in front of it because I've actually given it a name. Um, so I, I um, um, so there's some details of the name. So down here is where I'm actually providing details of what is actually running in the um, uh, you know components of, of this application. So Azure vote back, this is the back end component of my um, my th this voting application that I'll show you here in a second. And if I look at the back end component, you see it has no public IP address. Um, the X this um, portal is actually showing me all the public IP addresses um, that Azure will assign to your your container if you ask for it. Um, there's also some details in here. This is how the, the the Kubernetes master knows how to balance things around within the, the physical nodes that are running your application. Um, so there is a you know 128 megs of RAM. So you know typically containers I mentioned are much lighter weight than a virtual machine. They don't typically need very many resources. This is actually a database, so it does actually need a little bit more memory. Um, and specifically, this is a Redis. Uh, it's actually running uh, Redis under the covers. Um, and in here, I'm also describing a fractional amount of CPU that I want to. Um, I'm declaring that this um, application needs. Um, so there's some interesting things that you can do with that. And you know, I mentioned I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but when I, I click on namespace. You can actually do things, um, you know, for instance, I can have like a production namespace and a, a test namespace all running on the same Kubernetes cluster. I can give you permission to deploy things to the test namespace and I can create quotas saying, um, you know, you can only use half of a core of resources on that, on, you know, on, on all the nodes that you're running across. Um, so this 100, uh, 100M is actually a uh, um, let's see here. I think I've actually got uh, uh, so right here. You can see that a um, that a CPU is defined as a core in Azure. And so if you say uh, you know 0.5, then that means it's it's half of a core. So if you say 100 M, then that means it's 0.1 of a core. A, t you know, a tenth of a core. So, so it's a unit of measure that you use to describe, you know, some fractional amount of that CPU. So that's how we try to make sure that your application remains as performant as possible. Because if a if a node starts getting overloaded, um, you know, the the master controller uses that as a vehicle to say, okay, this node is getting um, getting pretty hot. I'm going to move your application because it needs 0.1 CPU, and you know, we're already running at you know. So is that a minimum? Yeah, yeah. So that that's, so that's minimum a, available yeah. CPU. Yep. So then I have a, a limit, so I'm actually telling it with the maximum that I want to use as well, um, as well as the maximum amount of memory that I want to use. So that's all. All um, you know, you can think of the the master controller as kind of the babysitter that kind of keeps its eye on things based on what I define. T to me, um, when I've moved or, or modernized applications and moved them into Kubernetes, that part is probably the hardest part to get. You know, because it's when you deploy it to a virtual machine, I mean, you've got the entire VM at your disposal, um, and this is kind of a, a, a trickier thing to try to figure out how to tweak. And also, you have to remember that you don't have all the overhead of the operating system coming along with it. Um, so this is just your application. You know, the the amount of execution per um, 
uh, not really performance, but capacity that your application needs. Um, so that's kind of a, you know, something that you have to experiment with, I think would probably be the easiest way to kind of go about. I don't think there's a really, there's not a hard and fast formula that I've seen with that. Um, so also in here you define what ports, um, in this case, this um, this is my uh, my Redis database. So it's listening on port 6379 within the, the pod that I've deployed my application into. So that pod's got a, a front end, a back end, um, as well as an application service. So, um, so then I can actually see, um, here's the definition of the, of the, um, the service. So now first I, I told it what container I want to use, how much CPU it needs. And now I'm telling Kubernetes, okay, now this is the service that I'm actually going to run, um, you know, within, uh, you know, within the runtime environments. This is where you can define things like IP addresses and that sort of thing. So you see the port is actually, uh, you know, specified in here again. And here is my front end, um, and this is where I'm telling it to pull from. Uh, this is actually a public image coming from Microsoft, um, and it's the uh, V1 of this Azure voting engine. Um, so when you specify a container, you can, if I didn't give it a version, it would use the latest one. Um, but it, I can also, you know, very specifically say I want to use this version of the container image that's deployed into this registry. Um, and this one's public, so like I said, you know, you could deploy this to your environment as well without any credentials or anything. Um, so again, you know, CPU and memory, and I'm telling it in this particular case that I want it to run to, to expose port 80. So this is actually exposing port 80 from the container to my runtime. And then I have to de define a service just like with the, um, uh, with the backend. And in this case, the, um, the service that, that is in, um, for the front end in Kubernetes, I'm telling it that I need to deploy a load balancer in Kubernetes, which um, immediately, because my uh, my Kubernetes cluster has is publicly facing, when I tell it to create a load balancer, um, Azure will assign a public IP address to uh, this service. Um, so you you notice I did not do that for my backend node. If I go back up to the service uh, definition for that, there's no uh, no such description in there for the service or the backend. So that's that's private. My front end's public, and I'm putting a load balancer in front of it. Um, and, and telling it to run a port 80. And the load balancer has a special meaning in Kubernetes because I can actually have um, Kubernetes scale the number of front ends that are running to be able to host, you know, to accept traffic coming into my application. All of them are listening on port 80, and all of those are sitting behind a load balancer in Kubernetes that's listening on port 80 that has a public IP address. So that's how you um, create a, um, a application. And you can actually deploy them. If I go, um, uh, so this is, uh, whoops, this is my nano. Uh, yeah, so right here, um, kubectl is a command line utility you can use to interact with your Kubernetes cluster. So I've already authenticated to it. Um, and this is how you deploy it. So I'm, I'm just telling it apply, and I'm, I'm telling it I want to apply the file that I'm, I'm giving it there. So I can also see that if I go to my uh, my services, if I go to like the front end, if I hit edit, um, this is all the stuff that I've that I defined in that file, and it has a little bit more stuff in it as well. Um, what I um, this is actually the this includes information about how it's deployed in Kubernetes. Now, it, not only does it contain the details that I just showed you in the YAML file, um, but it's also including uh, details. This is actually the port internal to Kubernetes that this is actually running on, and it's exposing that um, that port to um, there's is listening on that port, um, but and responding on port 80. You know, and the load balancer is assigned to it. I can also see what the IP address is. Um, this is the private IP address that it gets in my cluster. And because I told it that I wanted a load balancer, if you remember, I said as soon as I deploy this, um, what happens in the Azure world is uh, Kubernetes is very, uh, you know, we're a contributing developer to the Kubernetes project. And when you declare a load balancer in a deployment manifest for Kubernetes, um, that has a special meaning in Azure. And when, when you do that, we give you a public IP address. Um, 
So this is actually the public IP address of my application. And if I go back um, to uh, my pods, uh, I'm sorry, services. Um, so I can see, you know, that data kind of in summary here. And if I click on this, um, on this link, this is actually that that IP address. This is my application running publicly. It's a kind of a voting app that you can. So that every time I click on a button, it's actually putting a record into into Redis. Um, you know, so if you were to open it, you'd actually see those same same results on uh, on your environment. So, dogs. Yep. <laughs> I'm a, Keep I'm going. A, I'm yeah. with you. <laughs> I, I'm allergic to cats. No, I mean, I've had a cat before, but I'm allergic. yeah. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, they, they tend to bother me, uh, kind of give me the sniffles too. Um, so, you know, that's kind of a, a walkthrough of deploying an application. Um, this is kind of a, a you know, simpler example. Um, and sometimes, you know, so, so th this, this is an example of taking an application and, and you know, I, if I were to deploy uh, multiple applications in this way, each one of them would get a public IP address. Um, you know, sometimes it might be beneficial to have a reverse proxy to do SSL offloading and pass those requests back to my application, um, or to to perhaps um, you know have some some rules. Maybe I want to have a container running, uh, you know, housing all of the JavaScript libraries that my application is using, and another container running the application runtime component. So if I go to you know my app slash uh, JS, it actually goes to container one. If I go to my app, it goes to, um, you know, container two. So you might want to do some intelligent routing, you know, some HTTP layer seven type routing to, to your application. So there's, there is a way to do that um, in using something called an, you know, an Nginx, which is a, you know, reverse proxy that you can deploy, um, you know, divert even to, to virtual machines, but you can also run it as a container. Um, so uh, it's deployed in my cluster here under, you um, these namespaces I talked earlier about how you can create namespaces, put policies on them, put permissions, put quotas on them. Um, but there's there's always one called um, Kube System where a lot of the internal ones, internal uh, containers are running uh, within your uh, your Kubernetes cluster. So I actually have a um, a Nginx controller, and I've told it that I want to have at least two copies of this controller running. So basically, it's running both of my um, my nodes that I have running in in Azure. So this is giving me high availability for my my front end for applications. And I can see, you know, these two um, these two instances or two services each have their own uh, their own IP address, but they're exposed with only one public IP address. This is actually how um, you know the the master controller kind of makes you know load balances traffic in addition to making sure my application is highly available. If one of these nodes goes offline, if this node went offline, that IP address would flip over to the other. So there's some intelligence there to, to be able to, um, you know, to, to make it uh, available. Um, also, you notice that, that there's a, you know, labels in here. So much like when you um, deploy a application using something like Azure DevOps, you can actually stamp that with, you know, this is version one, two, three, or, you know, um, this is my test version, this is my QA version. If you picture, you know, like I said, the, the, the sole, sole purpose behind this is to try to increase the density of your compute resources. So it's typical when you see a, a customer deployment where you have, you know, maybe 50, 60 or more of these deployed into a cluster. So, you know, finding, um, you know, the production version versus the QA version might be a little bit challenging. So that's where these labels come into play. These are just arbitrary tags that can be as associated with a deployment or a service to help you quickly locate them using some of the command line tools. Um, so on the Nginx front, I'm going to show you a little bit on how that how that works. Um, the um, So this is um, a another uh, another container that I'm deploying into uh, into uh, Azure that I'm actually um, uh, so I'm I'm using the uh, you know, this is actually a publicly available image from uh, Kubernetes.io. This um, uh, you know ingress uh, controllers is running um, nginx under the cover, so kind of a lightweight reverse proxy, um, and I've named it uh, WordPress ingress. Um, so I'm not doing any sort of you know um, HTTP rewriting or SSL redirection. You can actually put in rule, nginx rules in here as well. 
So you think when you, if you've ever deployed Nginx, you can actually configure all this after you deployed it. Well, this is a container that is instructing Nginx to configure itself when it comes up. So you need to put in all of the configuration details of that, um, you know, in, in your um, in your definition file for how you want to deploy your application. Right. So I have one rule in here. What my rule does is it. Um, so I have a, a WordPress site also deployed into Kubernetes, and I'm gonna gonna take traffic going to the root path of my Nginx controller at port 80, and I'm going to forward it to my zeroed goose WordPress. So, um, so when I do that, if I go to Nginx, and if I just hit this, um, there is my uh, WordPress site. Um, so th th it's using that rule I just showed that um, it's, it's... You, you really spent a lot of time on these demo apps. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not much for a UI guy. So. <laughs> no, it's, it's great, man. It's great. So, so anyway, that, that's kind of a, a walkthrough of a couple of different scenarios of how to how to deploy things. Um, I don't know if you had any any questions, maybe uh, on what I've talked about. I know I've kind of glossed over the, uh, a lot of the other things that you saw in, um, in here to actually see, um, you know, what's running on it, kind of the overall health. You can actually see um, this actually will help you a little bit. And I talked about kind of sizing them. I can actually see, you know, how much CPU, how much of a, each one of, the, um, of a CPU core that these containers have run and my application, even though it's public, it's not clearly not getting any traffic. So it's using a minuscule amount of the, the cores on this uh, on the VMs that it's running on. Cool. All right. Well, awesome. Hey, so how how large a container adoption are we seeing on Azure? So this is actually, I think, one of the hottest things in customers that I'm personally working with. Uh, one of the hottest things that that comes up again and again, um, you know, some some customers want to take, um, uh, you know, very large kind of monolith type applications and deploy them into a, a, a Kubernetes cluster. You can technically do that, but you know, there there is some effort required to make you know to to really make effective use of a Kubernetes cluster. I mean, if you take a really heavy weight application and deploy it into a Kubernetes environment, you're going to get the benefits of you know scaling and you know moving that that application around and so forth. But it's, it might actually need a lot of that CPU capacity, which minimizes the amount of other applications you can run in that environment. Um, so it's very well suited for you know kind of the microservices model where customers are, are you know building applications with a bunch of building blocks, stitching them together, uh, maybe adding adding on to the existing applications by adding additional services to them. So it's a really easy and effective way to be able to deploy additive components to applications customers already have running or to make use of, of the microservices mindset. Um, but yes, I, I see this being very heavily used across customers I'm working with. Um, and the, uh, the customer I talked about that has a SaaS product, um, they weren't in, in entirely familiar with uh, container, containerizing applications um, and you know, through some, you know, Small amount of handholding with them. Like I said, we we shrunk their footprint of their application down ten servers. Um, so you know that not only was it beneficial for them to to make it easier to manage because now they've got three. You know they have one cluster of machines they can easily deploy their application into. They have ten fewer servers that they have to patch wow. and to maintain. So yeah, um, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Okay, you got a website uh, with some more information we can throw up. Um, yeah. So certainly, uh, you know. Azure dot uh, uh, dot com is is a good spot to go. Um, we'll put it in the show notes and and um, well, I, I plug one uh, cloud simplified io actually does have I have a couple other deeper podcasts about how customers have used this more specifically. Um, and um, um, I'll also give you a link to uh, some hackathon uh, events um, as well as some material that uh, anybody interested can go through and and kind of walk through a guided lab on how to build up one of these and, and make oh, use that's, of it. That's really cool. I think that'll be really helpful. Yep. Okay. I'll do that. Okay. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much for yet again being on Taste of <laughs> Premiere. And by the way, guys, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. But uh, also check out Cloud Simplified. It's a great podcast or webcast as well. Yep. Um, and uh, you'll see a lot more Orion over there. <laughs> <laughs> Although, although this is pretty much becoming the Lex and Ryan show. So. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I actually have another guest next week. 
whose initials are not RB. All right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think. I don't think they're RB. Anyway. Um, hey, man. Thanks, thanks a thanks lot for, for doing me. this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime. And uh, guys, that's your taste of premiere. All right. Thanks.